That too. Oh yeah, well. <laughs> We're just letting participants in now. Okay, just great. I'm just wondering how I get a light in here that doesn't turn me red, but I, I, think I was it's gonna say good. it's it's quite bright reflecting off of your glasses. Yeah, uh, just, yeah. Just to confirm with both of you before we kind of get started, Nancy, would you prefer me address you as Nancy or Dr. Orweiler or Professor? Nancy's just fine. Okay, excellent. And you and pronounced then... my last name correctly too, which is, oh, excellent. <laughs> which is excellent. I don't usually, you know, I don't really care as long as they don't call me a bad name, but uh, <laughs> you did a great job, David. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, and then... Um, Minister Murray, MP Murray, or Joyce, which would you prefer? Well, I think MP, uh, I mean, Minister Murray to start, and then you can call me Joyce or whatever, yeah. Or boss. <laughs> you can call me Joyce or Minister Murray, but if I would say if you're talking to me, you like, it's just, uh, this is a relatively informal brunch, um, but that's, uh, so deciding whether it's title or name is up to you. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, no, it's really, uh, uh, you know, one thing, Nancy, that I was wondering about as I was thinking about today's event is um, as an economist, what, how did you get interested in climate change? Oh, well, I've been in, this, I, I started my career in um, economics wanting to be a biologist. Mm and organic chemistry where you had to memorize a bunch of stuff drove me back into economics because you can make everything up. <laughs> so yeah. I've been doing it ever since, but I've always been interested in, in environmental issues. I grew up in a, 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 I grew up my early years, high school up to through high school, I lived in the US mm. and the um, infamous catching on fire of the Cuyahoga River near Cleveland oh, was, right. a defining, was a defining moment. Oh. Um, I was in university at the time and, um, you know, it was sort of like it, it, it catalyzed all of the, the problems. Now that was, you know, acute water pollution. Yeah. And in the late 60s, we weren't really, you know, we hadn't figured out about climate change. Mm. Uh, but when I moved to Canada, um, shortly after that, I, uh, I, I, my whole graduate career was, was on environmental issues. So mm. mm -hmm. like I started the first environmental economics courses in most of the universities I taught at. Mm. And so I've been in the game a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that was the era just after Silent Spring also. Mm -hmm. uh, well, later than that, the, yeah. the, the, the 60s and the 60s sort of was a turning point mm -hmm. in terms of the recognition and, and the Cuyahoga River catching on fire really, well, I mean, it was an international event mm -hmm. and it just galvanized, it visualized for people. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a river that is so polluted that it burns, That's you know, amazing. It, 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 is, it is one of those catalyzing events. And that period was when in the United States, sort of one of the heydays of their environmental movement, the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the passage of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water mm -hmm. Act of 1990, mm -hmm. followed in Canada by our Environmental Protections, Protection Act. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really, it was air and water pollution at the time, yeah. which were off the charts. And, you know, mm -hmm. you'll recall our um, our federal government's work on um, acid rain, which was mm -hmm. killing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, our, our forests in eastern Canada, which was causing yeah. massive smog events. And that was one of the, the really truly, you know, inter that and the Montreal Protocol. Well, and I wonder, yeah, and I wonder whether the uh, fires in California this summer will have the same kind of a uh, seminal turning point. Uh, effect on the psyches and, you know, the, the awareness of Americans and. Uh, well, Americans. yeah, I mean, I hope it spill, <laughs> spills over beyond the, the West Coast borders because, mm -hmm. you know, California has got some of the most stringent and progressive, certainly greenhouse gas rules, regulations and policies in, in North America. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I do think triggering events and that's one reason I'm talking about the virus and the COVID because there's so mm -hmm. many parallels. And yeah. you know, if we don't take lessons from these events, 
we're going to be in more trouble than we already are. Mm. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting times, but you know, we're hopeful that things will change south of the border, which will make it easier for us to um, deliver on the policies we have. Well, I'm not watching uh, news for the next four days and <laughs> until this. Can you, can you, can you really not do it? I can't, <laughs> I can't not do it. I have to do it. I can't. I'm like watching the polls like crazy yeah. going like, oh my God, is it, you know. <laughs> so, so you've been at this game a long time too, though. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, yeah. You've I, been involved in environmental issues for, for as long as I've known you. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to our guests. We're just about to get started here. Um, we'll just give it another moment for some more folks to join. I can see that we've got quite a few with us today. Um, so we'll get started in about, about 30, 45 seconds. All right. Well, Nancy, you were talking about ecological economics and um, that was my, uh, that, that's what I was weighing after my MBA and the thesis on uh, climate change in which I yeah. utilized the research results around the different ways of figuring out um, what, how people value something they may not actually pay for and consume directly. Oh, um, music to my ears. <laughs> yeah, so that was in, a, in, uh, in 92 and I thought maybe I'll go on and do a PhD in, in ecological economics. So I ended up going into politics instead. <laughs> well, you know, you've got to serve the greater good, but yeah. I mean, we would have loved to have had you uh, <laughs> as well. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I so was I also... Yeah, go ahead, David. Oh, I was just going to say we're we're just about we're just about at ninety folks joined here yeah. right now, and it's going steadily up. So I think we can get started if that's all right with both of you. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, welcome to our participants, to our to our friends, and to our neighbors of Vancouver Quadra, and and other communities too. Welcome to our um, our MP brunch connections. Um, we're delighted to be here, or I'm delighted to be here as your moderator today. My name is David and I'm one of the constituency assistants in the office of uh, the constituency office of Minister Joyce Murray, who is here with us today, as well as Dr. Nancy Oweiler um, from the School of Public Policy at Simon Fraser University. Welcome, we've got quite the uh, discussion here for you folks today. Just a quick uh, housekeeping item. Uh, as you will note, this is a webinar for Zoom, so you're muted as participants and your videos have been turned off. If you have questions for our panelists, which we hope you do, please place those questions into the Q&A bar at the very bottom of your screens. It should be a button just on the bottom, and you can just push that and enter your questions. Uh, we will ask as many questions as we have time for. Um, through myself, our team will be gathering the questions and I will be directing them to the speaker uh, or the speakers, I should say. Uh, this program will run for about an hour um, and we hope you have a wonderful time ahead. We know that we will um, and it's going to be very interesting. So it is my pleasure to introduce Minister Joyce Murray, the Member of Parliament for Vancouver Quad. Well, thanks, David. And uh, you were being modest there. You're the constituency manager and one of the team, of course. Um, and welcome, welcome everyone. I'm, I always enjoy these monthly uh, sessions, discussions, and thank you so much for being part of this one. Um, and happy Halloween uh, tomorrow. Um, we're gonna be hearing from uh, Dr. Nancy Olaweiler, and I'll introduce her in a minute. Uh, but I just always like to touch into a few things that are going on in, in Ottawa or in the broader landscape of my work, representing you and working on your behalf. And so a couple of um, things I wanted to mention before that, though, for anyone who's new on this uh, branch, that these are nonpartisan events. I don't uh, screen my speakers for their, uh, their political affiations and the, our long-term guests know that sometimes they've been 
uh, very open about their disagreement with the Liberal Party or Liberal government, and sometimes they've been uh, positive. So that's it's nonpartisan, and everyone is uh, welcome uh, to join us. The invitation is open. So I just wanted to um, confirm that. And uh, we just had a, an election in British Columbia. And so I do want to congratulate uh, Premier Horgan for his success and, and uh, to all the elected MLAs who uh, uh, came through that election and will be taking their seats to represent British Columbians. And so talking about elections, of course, we just uh, avoided a, an election in a confidence vote. Um, and I wanted to just mention briefly, like, what was that about? I know a lot of people wondered. Uh, essentially, there was a, we as a liberal government felt that there was a very uh, hyper-partisan uh, motion to create a committee uh, that would be re uh, really refocusing parliament's attention on the we situation where the prime minister family was seen to be too close to a, uh, a nonprofit organization, a do-gooder organization, as one is one it, somebody in my network mentioned, um, and that that was not productive in terms of just how much it still is our focus. It's our hundred percent really focus as a government at trying to figure out what's coming with this pandemic, trying to figure out what kinds of supports the provinces and territories need to reduce the number of people getting the, the virus and dying from the virus. And so we had a difference of opinion with the conservatives and decided that we needed to just take a stand that our priority is responding to the pandemic emergency and the economic emergency that goes with it. And so that's what that uh, confidence vote was about, uh, which uh, fortunately, for me personally, I was not looking forward to being back in an election. I was won by, um, by uh, or parliament decided it was not time for an election. So that's what was happening there. Um, a couple of things that I'm particularly happy to make sure uh, that we all, um, that, that you know about is the extra money coming in for rapid housing. So. Vancouver gets about $50 million and on top of the national housing strategy money where BC has received 26.4% of that big pot of uh, infrastructure investment for housing. Uh, we are now uh, seeing a lot of money coming in to immediately create some housing for homeless uh, people who need it and the supports uh, to, to be successful in their new homes. So there's lots, lots else going on, um, but uh, I think what I want to do is, is uh, bridge over to our topic for today, which is how do we build back better in a way that, um, that uh, is going to really um, enhance and accelerate our action on climate. And so I was really uh, I'm thrilled that uh, Dr. Olaweiler was willing to come in talk with us about that. She, we were just chatting before this event started about her background as an economist and how she has been in, interested in researching environment and ecology as an economist uh, for her whole career. And I've always been so impressed with uh, Dr. Ola Weiler's pragmatic and very knowledgeable approach to these issues. So I couldn't think of anyone better at this point to come and talk to us about what she thinks are some opportunities. Um, uh, Dr. Oweiler is, an, as I mentioned, uh, an economist um, at uh, Simon Fraser University. And um, she's been, uh, she did her PhD at UBC. She uh, was the, in the economics department at Queen's University. Her areas of research focus on public policy, including natural resource, energy, climate, regulation, and risk. I have, I had the, um, also the privilege of having uh, Dr. Olaweiler agree to sit on the uh, deregulation um, advisory group, so streamlining or modernizing regulation for the government of Canada uh, advisory group that I, I 
was instrumental in setting up about a year and a half ago. And so I thought we need to have someone who's got environment at heart as we think about how to streamline, streamline regulation in a way that continues to protect people's health security and the environment. So um, and Nancy uh, has served on a number of boards of directors, including BC Hydro, PowerTech, Clan TransLink. Uh, she's a member of Climate Solutions Clean Growth Council, sits on the board of directors for the Institute for Research on Public Policy, Technical Safety BC, Genome BC, and the Pembina Institute. So I don't know how you have time for this <laughs> like today, Nancy. Uh, there's other things, uh, too many to list. Uh, really so happy to have you with us and uh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Minister Murray and, and David for your warm welcome. I'd like to acknowledge that I am today sitting on the uh, unceded and historical traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam and the Squamish people. And I'm very grateful every day for uh, even in a pandemic sitting in my home to be able to look out and have the, the wonderful lands around me. We are indeed very fortunate to, uh, to have inherited this land and, and it's our responsibility to do better than we have with it. So I'm gonna start out, uh, I'm gonna share my screen, hang on. And I have to do it this way. And then I'm going to start, there we go. Okay, um, the minister talked about how do we build back better? Uh, and that is certainly one of the themes that we have to come to. But today I wanna first start with how do we get to the place where we can even start to think about that? And I'm using, the lessons from COVID-19 or the, the living through what we are living through in COVID-19 to start to think about, to start to motivate how we, how we accelerate the actions that we have been taking, but not enough. I'm gonna talk about two curves. There's the main curve we have to flatten. And then there's the curves that get us to flatten the main curve. And this will all be revealed in the next couple of seconds. But then I want to dive down more deeply to go to some of those lessons and talk about areas where I think, you know, some, some changes can be made, but areas where we can, we can do better because we have to do better. So there's my start. Once we finish the pandemic, we've got the tsunami of climate change lurking behind us. So here's the first curve. Uh, and I'm gonna start with the, with the pandemic. This is, this is the R factor. Who thought months ago we would be epidemiology, you know, uh, wannabes and juniors. This is the curve that when the health authorities and the health experts start talking, they wanna reduce the reproduction rate. They don't want you or someone infected to infect lots of others. Mm -hmm. This is the curve that we ultimately in a climate setting are gonna to have to deal with this is the greenhouse gas temperature rise and all the associated events to it. That is the curve we have to flatten. How? Mm. In the COVID world, what we're talking about is getting people to change their behavior, is getting people to wear protective things, their masks, to keep their social distancing. And here are the, the, the bending of the curves to flatten the reproduction rate. So if you see here, and th these are all from the British Columbia CDC. So this is data from their October, the October briefing. We, it's not up to date to today. As you all know, things have gotten, uh, those curves have not gone down, uh, but this is contact. So this is if we reduce our interactions to reduce the spread of the virus, we will flatten that reproduction rate, which will ultimately lead to a extirpation of the virus. The parallel in climate is the GHG emissions. We have to not just flatten that curve, we have to bend it. So here's the curve that we are going to need to flatten. These are projections. The, the squiggly lines on the left-hand side are the actual uh, temperature variations. This is for British Columbia. 
Uh, we have an organization at UVic called the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium that takes global models and downscales them to the British Columbia. So we can see the impacts here. We live in British Columbia, we're global citizens. Our responsibility is global, but let's, you know, let's talk about us first. So look at these three curves. There are three curves. These are three different models coming from the International Panel on Climate Change. The red one is we just don't, we don't wanna go there. We don't wanna go there. I mean, that is a temperature range, uh, temperature rise of up to six degrees Celsius. We will not know the world if that happens. The second one is the Paris commitment, which is two degrees uh, normal. So remember, these are what will happen in BC, not uniformly across the province. The, the sort of yellowy line or the orangey yellow line is still not good, but the blue line is the Paris goal to keep it below 1.5 degrees. That is still not what it was. That is still up to a two degree Celsius uh, increment in average temperatures. We will have impacts. The impacts are now set. The, the question is, how do we avoid the worst? And here's the answer. This is the curves we have to bend. The first one is for Canada. The second one is for BC. Those red lines, the red line and the reference case, if we did nothing in 2015, based on 2015, we would be on runaway climate change. The bending of those curves are different policy, you know, uh, agendas. And that notice the scales on these things don't go to zero. The current policy regime federally is to get to net zero. And I'll explain that a bit later. The one on the right is BC, similar story. It just breaks it down into the sectors because we will have sector specific targets. What comes from transportation, what comes from buildings, what comes from um, you know, uh, industry sources. And again, these are getting us down. It's bending the curve. We are not there yet. And those bends have got to be pretty dramatic. So you know, think back to the COVID ones, 50% of your normal contacts, this is a substantial decrease in GHG emissions just to keep our climate curve as flat as we possibly can. So what other, you know, that, that's the story in terms of the data. What are some of the lessons that we can take from COVID and apply them to climate change and climate change policy? And there are five of them. I'm sure there are many more that all of you in the audience could, could think about and, and have your own lessons learned. But these are ones I wanna focus on today. It can happen more quickly than we're prepared for. We are we're not prepared for the pandemic. We are not prepared for the impacts of climate change. But the second one is like, uh, hello, plan. We need to plan before the worst of the crisis arrives. And the second key point is it's cheaper if you do that. All of the emphasis, and I'll come back to this, the emphasis on the cost of dealing with climate change mitigation or adaptation, you know, they're going like, oh, it's costly. It's costly if we don't. And I'll give you an example of that. I don't have time, but I could give you many more. Don't put all your eggs into one basket. Yes, the vaccine, if it works, will get us out of the COVID mess. But there are public health issues that our authorities are telling us now that flatten that, that curve and, and reduce our contacts. Those are through public health principles. So, you know, we all hope that there will be technologies that make it easier to deal with the climate crisis. These are things like negative emission technologies. That's the big the name for ones that either store or reutilize carbon. But if we wait and hope that those things come, it may be far too late. Fourth point is behavior changes. Dealing with the pandemic, dealing with the impacts, dealing with climate change is requiring behavior changes. I'm gonna make the argument that climate change is easier than a pandemic. Uh, and um, I'll show you why. And the fifth thing is the COVID has really brought out and, and dramatized the impact on vulnerable groups and huge inequities in society. As we all know, the vast majority of people who have succumbed to that horrible pandemic, that disease, are people, are older people and people 
uh, with pre-existing health conditions. And in other parts of the world, it is correlated with income and also with race and gender. So the same thing is happening and will happen with climate change. So let me go through these a little bit more in detail. Normal to crisis, we're not prepared. I've got two columns here. I'm not gonna, you know, you can, you can read as well as I can talk, but you know, these are the similarities. We are dealing with things we cannot know for certain. Science is an evolving, it, it, the, the beauty of science and the things people like to criticize is why can't you tell me the answer today? Well, that's what science is about. It's about figuring it out. On the virus side, you know all the uncertainties and you know that has led to changing, changing rules and orders and ways we do things. Climate is no different, but I would argue we are way further along on understanding the science behind climate change than we are this particular virus. Um, we know now, and I, you know, there are climate deniers as I've got there, just as there are virus deniers and vaccine deniers out there. But, you know, we are learning more, we are learning more about the effects, but we know it is anthropogenic. We know it is our emissions of greenhouse gases that is accelerating this. It is ubiquitous, borders don't stop it. And the crucial thing is when are we in a runaway? When are, when are we beyond the point that we can control this leading to massive environmental, human and economic misery? And all of these things, both the pandemic and climate affect our whole well-being and our environment. So we have to be prepared. Some people say, well, yeah, we're not in a crisis. We talk about a crisis. We are in a crisis. We are in a climate crisis. 2020 is going to be, as soon as it's over, we're already on track to be the warmest year on average since temperature recordings occurred. Um, the problem is not everybody sees it. We don't see, like the pandemic, we know there's a crisis, but even there, some people are oblivious to it. It's not gonna affect me. It's not that bad. It's a bad cold, you know, and sort of climate is the same. Well, you know, what's wrong with a little warming? I'd like it warmer. No, no, you don't want it warmer because there are all sorts of things that are going to happen. As I said earlier, people might think it's too costly, but I'm gonna say it is costly if we don't do it. Here's an example. Uh, we know British Columbia, the whole West Coast, uh, Minister Murray and I were talking about this at the beginning, the California fires, we had 10 days of, or eight days of smoke, terrible smoke. We know there are fires. We also know how to reduce their likelihood. And if they do happen, reduce the damages. We had a terrible fire season in 2003, the Kelowna and Barrier fires, lots of damage, a provincial report done by Gary Philman said, put more money into prevention, suggested a fund. Look at the table below. This is recent years. The prevention expenditures are under 25 million. The damage, the remediation, the suppression expenditures, the, the left-hand column, the, the $568 million in 2017 is what it costs to fight the fires and what it will cost. And that doesn't even count all the damages done because a lot of those are borne by the private sector through insurance and things. If you look at the amount of hectares we treated to try to reduce the risk, it is minuscule compared to the number of hectares burned. So, you know, and we're not doing enough, but it's way cheaper. It is way cheaper to prevent it than it is to deal with it what, when, when it happens. And by the way, the second bullet up at the top says the fires in 2017 outstripped any of the emissions of GHGs we could ever produce. We don't count them in our inventories, but we do count fire suppression, burning, controlled burning. So we've got an asymmetry in our policy. That's one we can fix. Another impact thing, 2017, bad year. These are the areas of flooding. So 
If people say it's not happening, well, it may not be happening in my backyard, but it's happening in a lot of people's backyards. And you can see massive parts of the interior of British Columbia. And we could talk about the Calgary floods and the, the Quebec floods and the extreme weather events in Toronto and everything else. These are, and they're now models to show the relationship between extreme weather events and climate change. Not all of them are due to climate change, but a large number and they are increasing. For those of you who feel sanguine about it, I know this is a prediction of the 500 year flood that may occur tomorrow or next year. This is the inundation. And look at the depths here, Far flood depth, zero to 0.5 meters, up to five meters in parts of the Fraser Valley. I noticed Minister Murray, your writing is relatively unscathed, but um, that, not everybody else's is. These are big, big, potential changes. Okay, so what do we do about it? We do have plans. We need credible and feasible plans. And again, I'm paralleling COVID. Our COVID BC plan is a classic uh, uh, pandemic response playbook. Dr. Bonnie Henry, the spokesperson, is going by the plan. And up until very recently, it has delivered incredible results. BC has been a, an amazing region. Atlanta, Canada has done better, but BC has done very well. Our governments have done very well. Economic remediation was quick and mostly on target. Minister, <laughs> the minister was talking about, you know, rolling out that support for students. You know, this is hard to do, but basically both our federal and provincial governments have done very well, but we were not prepared to address vulnerable people the horrific effects on long-term care homes and our elders is what we were totally unprepared for. And I've said both the Canada and the BC plan. Then we have our neighbors to the South and I don't need to tell you anymore, it's a disaster. Our climate plans, this is the name of our BC plan, Clean BC and basically the Pan-Canadian framework in Canada. We do have climate plans. Let me talk a bit about them in terms of these criteria. Are they credible? BC's plan is designed to get us 75% of the way to our target. You saw those predicted downward sloping curves. Uh, in the coming year, we are going to be seeing policies that will get us the rest of the way. The federal goal is now looking at net zero by 2050. And at the end of the time with questions, if anybody asks me, I'll explain what that means. But it basically means no net GHGs. Either we, we control them or we don't emit them. Are they consistent? Here the story isn't so good. We've gone uh, a decade or decades without having consistent policy. Um, in this province, we started with a carbon tax and then things kind of came to a screaming halt. In the federal role, very little action was taken over a long time period. We have lost valuable time. Are we good at telling people what happens? We're terrific on now on emission levels. Both our provincial government and our federal government report annually our GHG emissions, but we're not telling people enough, and this is going to be one of my main themes, about how we're building climate resilience. Those wildfires are going to happen. Some of those floods are going to happen. How are we building a plan for that? Suppose people, I think one of the success stories in the COVID story is that the experts are the spokespeople, at least in this province, backed up in, in federally, the prime minister has been the spokesperson, but backed up with, with public health people. Um, that is not the same on the climate file, and I think that should change. It's my personal view. Vulnerable groups, we can deal with some of it. We know how to deal on the climate file even better than the COVID file. We have policies to address uh, vulnerable groups. Climate policy basics. So where do we want to be? This is just, a, and I know you had a talk uh, a little a year or so ago by uh, Professor Mark Jackard. He's talked all about the policies. What we want to do is do both. Here's a little four quadrant diagram that says we have to both reduce our emissions, we have to bend that emission curve, but we've also got to take into account in the flattening of the climate curve that there will have to be adaptation. We want policies that do both. We don't want to be where the big red X is, and that is no action. Should we wait till technology changes us? My answer is yes, keep investing in technology, but don't count on it. We have 
in both COVID and climate safe bets, public health issues in COVID and carbon policy, carbon pricing, regulations, the things Professor Jacquard talked to you about. Here's a picture of them. There's a whole panoply of these policies. No single policy is gonna work. We need them all. They're different sectors, they're different impacts. We have the tools. We are using them, but not enough. Behavior change. I think it's gonna be, it should be easier for people to behave in a way that reduces our climate uh, risks than even the pandemic. We're not asking you to stay home. We're not asking you to change your job. We're asking you to do it in ways that reduce the amount of emissions that you produce. And the cost increases, which are temporary, the cost of changing out your heating source, the cost eventually of buying a vehicle if you have to drive and you don't live in, in Vancouver and can walk everywhere, you know, those are costs, but they're short-term costs to have long-term gains. It's an investment. It's an investment that will pay off. We're not asking people to not heat their homes. We're not asking people to do anything else. So it's become oppositional politics to focus on the short-term costs. And this has cost us in terms of climate action. We know how to address all these costs. We also know how to address vulnerable people. We know how to protect them. We have policies in BC. We have the climate refunds. The federal government gave people their climate check. I mean, there are more and better ways to do this, but not enough attention has been paid to all of the impacts that are already happening because of climate change, the vulnerability due to the things I talked about earlier. And this is a huge gap. So we've got mitigation plans, but we're still planning for adaptation. This is the federal carbon uh, climate change adaptation plans. Notice the verbs here making, investing, developing, addressing, supporting, working. I want to see those become action verbs, not aspirational. I want to see the words that say, we have given you the information of what we can do. We have invested in infrastructure. Those green infrastructure, infra, <laughs> green infrastructure funds, get them rolled out there, Minister Murray. Do your bit. You know, I want to see those become action verbs because the more prepared we are, the lower the cost, the fewer people that are gonna be irreparably damaged and the le lesser costs on our economy. Those should be action verbs. We're no better in BC. We have massive amounts of the adaptation work going on, but it was not a significant part of clean BC. It should be coming. Now that we've had our election here, I challenge our provincial leaders to come out and say, we need, yeah, we have to prepare for a changing climate. We all know that, well, let's do it. I showed you these at the beginning. Where are we? We've kind of flattened the emissions curve. But as I said at the beginning, that's not the curve we got to flatten. We got to flatten the climate curve. The emissions curve has got to be bent. This is BC. This is our latest GHG reporting. Uh, you'll notice the numbers went the wrong way. Um, this is before the introduction of Clean BC. That's the recent, most recent year we've reported out at the end of um, the summer, early September on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock. Um, those numbers have gone up. We expect them to come down now that we have taken more action and gotten out of the climate hiatus that we had for a number of years here. Here's the federal numbers pretty flat. I mean, they go up and down, they bounce around, they'll probably be down this year because of the pandemic. But again, these are not the, these, I mean, flatten is better than going up, but we got to bend these curves. These are the ones we've got to bend. So the policy regime that we've got in place, whether it's Clean BC or the Pan-Canadian framework, has got to be accelerated to be able to bend these curves. How do we do that? Like the pandemic, we are all in that together. As I said, we need strong pro policy to achieve climate resilience. Climate resilience means we are prepared. We've got the adaptation, we are strengthening our reserves and we've got the policies to bend the emission curve. It has to be delivered consistently, both mitigation and adaptation. I'd like to argue that we need climate spokespeople and. I, with all due respect to my wonderful colleagues in, in the political sphere, 
it's too easily captured by politics. Where is the Dr. Bonnie Henry of climate? I think we need a Dr. Henry at the federal level and the provincial level. We need trusted spokespeople who are not political, who are following the climate playbook. There is a climate playbook on both mitigation and adaptation. It's not that we don't know what to do or how to do it. It's how it's getting it done. Get a credible spokesperson out there. And that will help us do the right thing. People want to do the right thing, I believe. We need some nudges and we need some spokespeople to get there. So again, we've got to bend those emission curves to flatten the climate curve. Thank you very much. Over to you, David. Wow, I'm speechless. That was <laughs> phenomenal. Thank you so much. That was tremendous. I'll leave it to, to Joyce to say more on that, but um, oh my goodness. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I mean, I learned a lot there, Nancy. That's not always the case for me, having been steeped in this for so long, but uh, I've got a good few things to, to take back to Ottawa. I mean, one thing I do want to let people know is that um, I was recently appointed to the Cabinet Committee on Economy and Environment, which is uh, a very um, uh, intense uh, set of work these days. And uh, I think that people can expect to see some real enhancement of our, of our climate plans we know that our prime minister committed to exceed the, the Paris targets for, for what we would accomplish in 2030. And there is a lot of rigorous work going on. How will we do that? So I think I just wanted to reassure the, the group that's with us today that, uh, that our government is very seized with this challenge of uh, bending the climate curve in Canada that I do wanna say that there's some really great ideas about how to be even more effective on that, Nancy, and I am, I am um, excited to have heard your thoughts there and I'm gonna take your slide deck <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that I'm, uh, that, I, that I'm not missing anything when I communicate this back in Ottawa. So thank you so much for that really great talk. My and pleasure. now it's over to our audience for your questions. And so. I, I think I'll just remind people, I'll remind myself if any questions come to me, I'll keep it short and I'll remind the questioners to keep it short and so that, that we hear as much as possible from uh, Dr. Oloweiler in our remaining time. Excellent. So the first question from Gary is, how do you convince, how do you change attitudes to convince others that every effort helps and contributes to the whole larger solution? Well, we, you know, they're carrots, they're sticks, and they're sermons, as I like to call them. The carrots are providing incentives. So things like reducing the cost to you, dropping out your, your heating source if you heat with a fossil fuel, and we have those kind of policies. Uh, the sticks, are one of my favorite topics, which is price it. Uh, uh, Minister Murray and I were talking about her, her, her thesis work or her project work about pricing things that don't have prices. We don't have a price on the climate, but we do through our policy lens. And that is the British Columbia carbon tax, the federal backstop uh, tax, the cap and trade systems in, in Quebec. These are pricing things. And I mean, I'm an economist, if you raise the price, people will look for cheaper ways to do it. We, we stopped people misusing leaded gas in un cars, taking unleaded cars by raising the price of gasoline. You raise the price of gasoline enough, I'm going to accelerate the time when I'm going to look for a cheaper way to do it, whether that's taking transit, transit, walking, or buying an electric vehicle or a hybrid. The sermons are people like me talking to you. And you know, trying to make and, and others, and this is where I think the spokesperson would help get out there and say, we are in this together. So three things, 
talking, showing, showing we can do it. We show we can do it on, the, on COVID in British Columbia and we can do it again. We can do it on climate, but we need a little help on both sides. Thank you. Um, Joyce, do you have anything to add to that? No, no, thank you. Okay. The next question is from Tim and it is, how do we articulate the benefit of leading by example in greenhouse gas emission reduction in Canada to friends and family who would suggest that until big emitters such as China and the United States of America reduce their CO2 emissions, there is no point in us taking further action. Sure, great. Tip, uh, uh, always the question asked. Uh, many, many different ways to answer that question. Number one, China's doing way more than we are. So the argument that China isn't doing enough is uh, wrong, just basically wrong. Uh, the cost of solar panels has dropped by between 80 and 90% from when they were first being introduced. Why? China. China, China, China. Investing in massive amounts of them, reaping big economies of production and drastically lowering the price. Um, so the United States, I don't wanna talk about it. I mean, <laughs> let's, just, let's just wait for a week and hope we can talk about more. Canada, what can, I, what can I say to do it? You know where the fastest job growth is in Canada? Job growth is happening in the renewable sector. Worldwide, last year, this year, I've, it's over the period, there, the total amount of new capacity for from renewable sources dominated electricity production. So part of the answer is the rest of the world is doing stuff. You know, are they as far ahead in some areas as we are? No, others are farther ahead. The other part of the answer is it is good business to do so. Job growth is there, innovation is there. We have some of the most um, innovative companies here in British Columbia and other parts of Canada working on issues to, re, you know, to get the same things we want every day. We want heat and light and all those things and mobility and they're finding ways to do it. So that's my answer. Others are doing it. We can benefit from this. It is not just a cost. Um, David, I think I will just ask uh, Nancy in the answer uh, to that question about the US is doing nothing would it be fair to say that the federal government at this time is undermining climate change, but states are doing a lot and cities are doing a lot. And so in aggregate, my guess is the United States is doing as much if not more than, than most countries and potentially even Canada at the state and city level. Absolutely. The state of California is of course a world leader and some of the other states are the, the problem, you're, you're absolutely right, Minister. The problem is the Fed, the actions at the federal level are undermining these. So yeah. things like the Trump administration uh, challenging California's right to have uh, fuel efficiency standards more stringent than the national guidelines. Yeah. I mean, it's like throwing, uh, pardon the expression, gasoline on, an, on a fire. So until that deliberate actions and I mean, deliberate actions to go backwards are, are, lead, are removed. It's, it's harder for those states, but yes, they're champions at all levels, but the, it, the, the current climate, so to speak, is, is horrific. On the climate, oh, well, never mind. Yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> the, the next question is, can either of you, or I'm sure both of you can, but can you explain what does it mean to have a warming of 2.5 degrees? It sounds minor, but what does that mean in terms of um, average everyday items? You want me to go first? Absolutely. Okay, it means more of those forest fires. And as we saw this morning, or this morning, as we saw this fall, it, if they don't even have to be in our jurisdiction to affect us. It means those flood maps I showed you will not be once in 500 years, they'll be you know, frequent. Uh, our food costs will go up. So if you ask about how this affects my daily life, our food costs will go up. Crop production 
will be in some cases, some marginally enhanced, but the introduction of new pests, new invasive species as we are fighting already, of uh, extreme weather events, the hailstorms that take out the entire crop, um, our food costs will go up. Our uh, heating or our cooling costs will go up. Uh, effect on mort mortality, the, the heat, uh, people, people start at 2.5 degrees doesn't sound like a lot when it's eight degrees out, uh, but 2.5 degrees when you're at 34 is the difference between life and death for people that don't have the ability to cool themselves. So we will see it. The issue is some of these are going to be more extreme in future years, but we're already seeing it. I have a couple to add on the um, environmental front, um, and I'm not an academic on this, so correct me, Nancy. Um, we, we are already seeing cedar trees dying out in many of the forests in which they are an integral part of the forest, the, the mixture of tree species. And if you drive uh, along uh, highway number three, for example, and you'll see the, the red and black <laughs> treetops that are dead cedars. Um, species loss, uh, I was listening on the radio the other day, it's in the millions in a matter of years, mostly insects that are um, going extinct. And we have to think a bit about which songbirds we're counting on those insects for their viability. So what's this going to do for shrinking the diversity of our, of our species? Acidification of the ocean happening already, and that will accelerate. And then that means some of the shellfish won't be able to form shells. And it's, I mean, look at coral reefs and impacts on other fisheries, which is a key food source for a big chunk of the world's population and through protein. And, and the last one that came to mind for me was the thawing of the tundra. And when that thaws, what's happening is it's releasing methane, which is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas emission. Nice. And, uh, and it's adding to the challenge. And you know, what is, what is uh, which Nancy and I as veterans in this are both aware that all of these things were predicted back in um, you know, 1992 at the, at the World uh, yeah. Summit on Sustainable Development, which is also the time at which I did my research for my, my MBA. So it's tough to yeah. see things yeah. that we knew were um, outcomes of not taking action and it's been tough to push for action. But I Damn think- it. Things yeah. are shifting. Things are shifting. I think the public awareness and willingness to support uh, uh, some of the sticks that might even affect them, like pollution pricing, I think that's shifted enormously in the last handful of years. So I remain an optimist. Youth, 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 youth. The people that will inherit the mess are there. Yeah. Salmon. Thanks for twigging my, you know, the the massive reduction in salmon yeah. stock. Yeah. Um, the methane release from the perma, uh, the the, uh, the permafrost is not just a climate accelerant. It means that the people living in the north have no ice roads, so mm -hmm. getting food and and supplies to them. So it, the, the list is huge. The next question is. Okay, we have to have we have to have a hopeful one now, <laughs> David. <laughs> Yes, well, it is because we do take action. We, you know, the curve can be bent. Yeah. Two, yeah. two degrees is, you know, yes, there'll be impacts at two degrees, but they're going to be a lot less than if it's four degrees or six degrees, and we will be prepared for some of them. We are, yeah. you know, here's where science can come in as well in looking at drought resistant crops, heat resistant crops, you know, crop diversification. Um, I don't know if we can save the cedars and the salmon, but you know there are other things that we can do. I mean, we are not powerless even on the on the adaptation side. So this is a slightly different question next, but perhaps you can both talk about what a climate science spokesperson or spokes committee might look like in terms of uh, provincial and federal jurisdiction 
and how they might work with the political entities and the public in terms of getting the information out there on a, on a practical level and, and what you can envision for them taking on. I think the minister should start because she's the politician. And <laughs> is this a workable idea, minister? The Yes, it is. Absolutely. And I think that they have that in Germany, actually. Their biggest transition was the energy wind, which was getting off of coal and onto clean electricity. They have a federal... Uh, a provincial or federal and state uh, structure as we do in Canada. And they had the, a committee or a commission uh, of scientists and policy experts that has been uh, advising the government uh, through different, uh, different governments in Germany and, uh, and uh, writes reports on where there is need for more action, what's working, you know, does the tabulation of the effectiveness. So there is a, and actually, I had some meetings with the German person who is uh, the head of the Energy Wine uh, Committee and uh, proposed that uh, years ago in federal government to think about that approach. Um, so it's not that we have to copy what the German uh, government is doing. I think your, uh, your image of the Dr. Theresa Tam and Dr. Bonnie Henry is fabulous. I think that it would be a national spokesperson and uh, and provincial spokespersons, and, but in a, a coordin more coordinated uh, approach. I think the biggest challenge that we would have to design in on purpose is what are ways to have this survive changes in government, because that's the biggest nightmare for me is whatever we do, will we be followed by a government and a prime minister that is as committed to this as Justin Trudeau is? And I can tell you, he's really committed. And I've, uh, you know, it's, there's very few people in this cabinet that are ho-hum on climate. I mean, it's just awesome to be with a group of people that are super committed. So it's, uh, um, but that won't always be the case. So how do we make this um, resilient to political change. That's the biggest question. And we would look to people like Nancy for good design for something like that. If, if we were, could come, um, go forward with uh, a proposal based on your suggestion here, Nancy, which I think is brilliant. So legislation helps. <laughs> it's harder to undo legislation than it yeah. is setting up a committee. I yeah. got a list of people who would be great at this. I mean, we have a former MLA that uh, is a climate scientist who resigned his seat. He's not a yeah. bad spokesperson, Andrew Weaver. Um, but, you know, th th there are a few uh, sticking points. We do have provinces that took the federal government to court over its uh, pan-Canadian framework and imposing the climate, uh, the carbon tax as the backstop. And they would be a little bit tougher to get at the table, but um, if their populace starts seeing it, the, the, the actions taken in the federal level and, and the other provinces who would say, you know, we have a responsibility to do this. So we have many more questions um, and not so much more time, but uh, I think Maybe we'll count this as the last question, unless unless you two would like to continue. Uh, I'll be shorter in my next answer. So let's yeah, me too. We're, we're you're, you're talking to two people that don't shut up. <laughs> Sorry, me. I can't say anything for the minister. <laughs> so uh, the question is: as re as the resistance to changing behaviors toward more clean energy consumers. Um, as, as we do in COVID while using a mask, changing consumer behavior and consumption, how, how is the economic support on education towards future generations going to change the use of natural uh, non-renewable resources? And how do, you, how do you think that's going to um, pan out? I'll be very quick. I already mentioned youth. I mean, the march on climate, you know, the climate marches that we had pre-COVID uh, seems like a long time ago now, but uh, it is embedded in our educational system now, I think, and other than some regions, I can only speak to 
to locally and nationally. And the youth are well aware of this because it's it, they're going to inherit it. So um, I stopped using paper napkins when my daughter was in grade four and said, mom, cloth napkins are just as good. So when our children tell us what to do, we will start doing it. So yes, I'm optimistic. Okay, I second that. I see it in every classroom I go into. The first thing they want to know is what am I doing about climate? My, my grandson wears a mask in school. And when I said, is there any opposition to that? He goes like, grandma, it's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It's no different on this. It's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. The difference will be, we will have more options. So as, as we do have, I mean, we did not have electric vehicles 20, well, we did, but we had electric vehicles in 1920, but there's a whole movie on that, how they got thwarted but we didn't have the, the options to do things. So part of it is getting the options out there that people can see. Um, you know, As long as an EV gets me to where I wanna go and I can charge it and everything else, why wouldn't I want one? I mean, other than cost, so we can help on those. So we do have the options now, which I think has been something that was not as good uh, 10, 20 years ago. And the kids need so time for one more, David. I think we're four minutes out. So I think we're probably not able to ask another question. I know that we have a poll that we'd like to, to share as well. So okay. I'll turn it back to, uh, to Joyce to, uh, to finalize the day's uh, proceedings. Thank you. Well, David, yeah. So uh, I see the poll is up on the on the um, screen and this just gives us a sense of for what you as as the the group that are participating uh, with my mp brunches would like to would like to hear about next and um you can always you can always send in a note with your ideas as we used to collect your ideas at the at the mp breakfast table um we welcome we welcome your ideas so uh, please take a moment to fill that out. David, will, uh, David are you going to round it up and uh, let us know uh, before we close out the meeting? I will certainly try to do so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is going to test my mental math skills. <laughs> okay, so how, um, how many minutes, how long are you giving people to fill it out? We'll give them another moment or two, but if you want to start uh, yeah. the next stage, then we yeah. can, I can pop in and give you the answers. Okay, well, so really all I have left to do here is to um, uh, thank you, uh, Nancy. Uh, doc Dr. Olaweiler, as you can see, has thought deeply about uh, this issue. And I th think it's brilliant to point out how we have changed our behaviors in a pandemic, in this crisis. We know that we can take action in a, in a uh, health crisis and an economic crisis. And so learning those lessons and translating them to our climate crisis uh, is a, just an excellent model for thinking about this. So I think I, uh, I think the group probably uh, shares my enthusiasm and let's just, uh, I know everybody's muted, but let's uh, give a round of applause to our speaker. Thank you very much. It's so, not quite the same as being in the room, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that energy, okay. Yeah, so, you know, in the aisles, but at least it allows people to uh, participate safely from the comfort of wherever their computer is. Well, or we could have unmuted everybody, but I'll think about that for next time. I'm, no, just, no. Going, I'm just going to. Uh, we have a. A little something green is a thank you gift, which will be delivered to you. Uh, it's also not as easy to just put a thank you gift in your hand in a situation like this, but we deeply appreciate. Uh, oh, that's lovely. Thank your, you. you. Your you, ideas. You. Yeah, also your, your, not just your time and ideas, but also your optimism, Nancy. So thank you for that. Yeah, well, thank you for the plant. You, I, I am a total plant lover. And by the way, they do help for indoor air quality. Uh, I kept telling my husband who says you have too many plants I go honey with the smoke 
bring on the plants, <laughs> clean in the air, not just to have the filter. Thank you, that's very lovely. I appreciate it. And thank you all for participating or for listening. And thank you to David for, um, for stewarding this and also for the, my team here that does the logistics that make this possible for me. And that's Ole, Benez, and Ying. So, and thanks everybody for coming. Without you, we wouldn't be doing this. So uh, feel free to share with friends and family for next time. We will likely be uh, speaking with an, uh, a local Aboriginal leader, uh, someone who graduated from SFU's Indigenous MBA and uh, will talk to us about Indigenous reconciliation. So hope to see you next month. And thanks so much for joining us today. Excellent. Enjoy your day. Safe Halloween. Bye, Thank everybody. you, everybody. Take care. And the poll answers are uh, in first place, we have environment and oceans protection. In second place, we have indigenous reconciliation and Canada China relations. Then we have housing affordability. The digital transformation as a part of the Build Back Better program, tackling the opioid crisis followed by Canada-USA relations. So Everybody's stay sick tuned. of the topic, I think. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you, take care. Bye, Nancy. Bye, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank David for all your help and thank hope it, so uh, it kept them at, they, nobody left, hardly anybody left, which is always a good <laughs> thing. So I was watching the participants. Take care everybody. Thank you. Have everybody. a good weekend. Take care.